behind every great revolution, there is a brave woman. There are many brave women. I'm so proud to be one of those women that make changes in their countries and in the world. This is the most dangerous and the most important war and duty for women to fulfill. Hello and welcome to season two of The Story of Woman. In today's world, it can feel like change is happening, but only in the wrong direction. While we agree there's still a lot of work to do, we're reframing that story. I'm your host, Anna Steckline, and each episode of this season, I'll be exploring how women make change happen from those at the top helping to drive it. We'll look at where we are in this long march to equality, what lies ahead, and how important you are in the fight. This isn't a story of a world that's doomed to oppress women forever. This is a story of an opportunity to grow stronger than ever before, exactly as womankind has always done. Hello, welcome back, and thank you as always for being here. Today, I speak with Tawakal Carmen, an extraordinary woman who has been dubbed many names for her pivotal role in the 2011 pro-democracy uprising in Yemen, also known as the Arab Spring. She's been called the mother of the revolution, the Iron Woman, and the lady of the Arab Spring. And she even won a Nobel Peace Prize for this work and for her work in the nonviolent struggle for the safety of women and for women's rights to full participation in the peacebuilding work that's happening in Yemen. Upon being awarded this prize, Tawakal became the first Yemeni, the first Arab woman, and the second Muslim woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize, as well as the youngest Nobel Peace Laureate at the time at the age of 32. She's also been named one of Time Magazine's most rebellious women in history. She's been one of Foreign Policy Magazine's top 100 global thinkers for three years. And she's been listed by CNN as one of the most powerful women in the Arab world. And you will see why that is very shortly. But her work did not start in 2011 with the Arab Spring. As you'll hear us talk about, Tawakal is a human rights activist and a journalist. In 2005, she founded an organization called Women Journalists Without Chains, where she started reporting on the political instability and the human rights abuses that were happening in Yemen. Around this time, she also began organizing weekly protests in Yemen's capital, which lasted for years and turned into daily demonstrations and got her arrested for it. You'll hear us talk about all of this today and how her arrest had the opposite effect of what the government was hoping for. No, they did not silence her. And we talk about the current situation in Yemen, which is one of the worst humanitarian crises in modern times, and how it stems from the counter-revolution that's been led by Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Iran against Yemen and other countries that are trying to become democracies. Tawakal speaks directly to those of us outside of Yemen about what's going on inside of the country at the moment, and we talk about what makes Tawakal proud to be a woman and to be Yemenese, and what keeps her hopeful for the future of her country and the region. This revolution is far from over. You may notice us wrap the conversation real quickly at the end. Tawakal had to jump off quite suddenly, so that's why. Also why this conversation is slightly shorter than the rest. But when you're changing the course of history for an entire region and really the world, you tend to be a little busy. So we'll take the time with her that we can get. But that's all for now. Thanks again for being here. If you like what you hear, please do share this conversation with a friend or on social media or anywhere else with a stranger on the street. It really, really helps. But for now, please enjoy my conversation with the mother of the revolution, Tawakal Carmen. Hi, Tawakal. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Anna. I'm so happy to be with you in your podcast. Thank you. And for joining us on your birthday. I just found out it's your birthday. So happy birthday and thank you for spending it with me here today. That's good. That's a good celebration. (laughs) Good way to celebrate. Excellent. So you have such an incredible 
and powerful story that I can't wait to get into with you today. But I first want to start off by providing a bit of context to our listeners about the Arab Spring and about what Yemen was like kind of in the years leading up to it. So for any listeners that might be unfamiliar, the Arab Spring was a wave of pro-democracy protests and uprisings that took place across the Middle East and North Africa around 2011, with millions taking to the streets and challenging some of the region's authoritarian leaders. Tawakal, feel free to elaborate on that, but I would also love to have you tell us a bit more about what life was like in Yemen in those years leading up to the Arab Spring, some background information of what the country was like and the types of issues that you began demonstrating against. Thank you so much for talking about Arab Spring in this time while Arab Spring is, you know, suffering from many conspiracy against it that suffer also from counter-revolution led by the regional powers like Saudi Emirates and Iran and suffer from coups, terrorism, and civil war, and many of challenges. But in general, Arab Spring came as a cry for justice, freedom, and democracy. People went to the streets, demonstrate for freeing themselves and freeing their societies from authoritarian regimes. And they did a great work, a great effort, a great revolution against those authoritarian people, against those dictators in the region. And Arab people make a lot of successful steps on overthrowing, on forcing dictators in eight countries to leave the power. Arab Spring is a very strong revolution for democracy, for freedom, for justice, for equality, for good governance. And it is a continuation, you know, a continued revolution. Didn't stop, didn't die, and didn't lose hope. We're still in the battle for freedom and democracy, and we will win this battle in the end. Absolutely. And I want to kind of go through the story of what happened after the Arab Spring in 2011 and what you see as a pathway to democracy in the future moving forward. And you've given us a bit of a picture there with the counter-revolution. But tell us about what was going on in Yemen right around 2011 time, because you actually began demonstrating a couple years before that even happened in 2011, and, and you saw this kind of taking off across the region. So can you tell us about how you came to start organizing the weekly demonstrations against the government years before this wider revolution began? The welfare, democracy, and for freedom came before you know, the Arab Spring. And especially my call, you know, for freedom and democracy. I started this thing through my articles since maybe 2003, 2004, calling people to refuse the injustice, to demonstrate against the tyranny and to demonstrate against the wars and the terrorism waged by the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. And, you know, Yemen was, you know, in the rank to be announced as a failed country under the rule of the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. Yemen has a lot of wells, has a very good geographical position, and has a very strong population, and has a very strong history. So it doesn't deserve to be portrayed as a failure in our country, and also as a country that suffers from poverty and from terrorism, from lack of education, etc., etc., which is all this was under the rule of Ali Abdullah Saleh. So through my journalism in a work, and then through my organization that I established that was called Women Journalists Without Borders, then the government closed it and we announced another organization, Women Journalists Without Chains. So through this organization also, it was my way to criticize the dictatorship in general and the dictator himself in particular and to organize many, many activities against him, especially on supporting democracy rights and especially the expression rights. So my organization Organization Women Journalists Without Chains was the most important gate for me as a journalist and as a human rights activist to stand against dictatorship in Yemen. And then calling for the 
peaceful revolution against the dictator. And since 2006 until 2011, my organization, Women Journalists Without Chains, organized weekly demonstration in front of the cabinet calling for freedom of expression and for some certain human rights issues. And we didn't stop this demonstration until we encouraged people to make revolution against the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh. So since May 2006 until February 2011, we didn't stop our weekly demonstration in front of the cabinet every Tuesday. And then it became every Saturday and Tuesday, and then every Saturday, Monday and Tuesday, until it became daily demonstration raising the slogan of peaceful revolution against the dictator. So this is a summary of my work before the revolution. But the revolution itself, it came by the people of Yemen, by Yemeni people, by women in Yemen, by youth in Yemen. We decided to make the revolution against the dictator. In the beginning of January 14, after the winning of the Tunisian revolution against Ben Ali, we announced our formal revolution in February 11, 2011. It was the biggest announcement that all Yemeni people from most of the governors go to the street chanting that people want this corrupt and this tyranny to leave the authority. It is not just one time in 2011, it's from a lot of steps and a lot of struggle before that. But 2011, as the year of Arab Spring, become our opportunity to announce formally our great revolution against the dictator. Absolutely. There is so much, so much leading up to that. And the dictator himself had been in power for 33 years up until that time as well. So this was no short stint that he had been around. And you yourself, with all of your work demonstrating and organizing, you were actually imprisoned for all of that. Can you tell us about what that was like and what kind of impact that had on the movement? Prison itself, it's the biggest mistake that the dictator committed. (laughs) Many times he arrested me since 2006 until the revolution began. As I told you, there is two times of the revolution. The revolution started in 15 January. 2011, but it's formally announced in February 11, when Ta'iz and other governorates follow us and follow Sana'a, the capital, in this great revolution. But the biggest arrest was in 22 January 2011, when they kidnapped me from the street and put me in the woman prison. Before that, that was some small arrested. They accused me that I want to trouble the regime and I am belonging to a legitimate organization that attacked the republic, etc., etc. They thought that they will shut my voice up and they will stop me from organizing the students, especially the students of Sana'a University and other human rights activists and other victims and people, Yemeni people, to be with us in the revolution. But they made the opposite. My voice became stronger and reached to most of Yemeni governorates. And Yemeni people went to the street, demonstrating, raising my photo, calling for my freedom, and at the same time, chanting the same chant that I was chant. I was angry because they kidnapped me, they arrested me. My house is near to the police station. They can call me and I will go. They didn't need to kidnap me from the street. But at the same time, at that time, I said, okay, this is the biggest opportunity for any person that really suffer and call for freedom and justice. They think that the prison will hide him while the prison is making him or her very strong. And that is what happened with my voice. Absolutely. It helped ignite the spark and really backfired on the people who arrested you. And all of it also got you really known. I mean, all of your work and the imprisonment and everything that came after, you know, you're called the mother of the revolution, the Iron Woman, the Lady of Arab Spring, and you got a Nobel Peace Prize from it in 2011 as well, right? Which is just incredible. 
it is not just my struggle. It's the struggle of all Yemeni people, all yeah. women in Arab Spring countries. It's the dream of Arab people to have their freedom and democracy. I am only, you know, their voice. I'm so proud that I started this call from early, but it is really the desire of every person in our country, in our region, that we want freedom, we want democracy, we want rule of law, and any chance that we will be able to come together to raise our voice against this injustice, we'll take it. And this is what happened in Arab Spring. And this is what happened in Yemen. As I told you, even before the revolution, I was very well known in Yemen. And people in Yemen was really, really respected me a lot as a woman that represent their demands, that represent their views for a new country. They said that Yemen is a conservative country, and which is right, and Yemeni people doesn't accept the rule of women, which was right under the rule of Ali Abdullah Saleh. But in the reality, no, Yemen was ruled by two great queen, and Yemeni people are so proud of their queen of Sheba, Bilqis, and queen Arwa, and there's other queens. And also Yemen accepted my rule as Tawakkul Karman from 2005. They accepted my rule as one of the people that give them power, that can lead them. I am so proud of Yemeni people that they accept me as a woman. There was a lot of challenges from the dictator, from the traditional, from the religious people, but the real people, the real society was waiting for me and was believing in me and following me and helped me and support me a lot. So this is a collective victory, not just for me, it's a collective victory. Absolutely. Absolutely. A collective victory, but they're amplifying your voice. You're amplifying theirs. It's beautiful how you just laid all of that out. And I definitely want to get into the important role that women played in the Arab Spring, in Yemen and beyond. But I kind of just want to finish off the story first of what happened. We talked a bit about what it was like in the lead up to 2011 and how it was years in the making. And then you had these uprisings all across the region And then you mentioned in the beginning the counter-revolution. So can you kind of just walk us through what happened from there, from 2011 onwards with the president stepping down? You know, there was the beginning of a national dialogue happening, but then you had some outside forces coming in. And this is when the counter-revolution began and it led to the war and the crisis that's currently going on. Thank you, Anna, for your good questions. You know a lot about Yemen because you are talking about the national dialogue that followed the stepping down of the dictator. And uh, we did a great revolution, peaceful revolution against the dictator, Ali Saleh. And Yemen is an armed society on more 70 million pieces of weapons. All Yemeni people, the tribes, the people, they didn't use their weapons in front of all the kind of violence was practiced by the dictator. And because of that, because our peaceful method, we succeeded in this great revolution. And we pushed the dictator Ali Abdullah Saleh to resign. After about one year of daily demonstration, after sleeping in the streets, in the tents, etc., etc., we gathered all Yemeni people in the change squares and freedom squares, even from the tribes that they fought each other for decades. So all that thing makes Yemeni people work very hard to enter to the transitional period peacefully and to accept each other in the transitional period. So we did a great transitional period. We organized national dialogue. The national dialogue, we gathered most of the Yemeni parties, tribes, even Houthi militia, we invited them to be with us in this national dialogue. Even the party of the dictator, Ali Abdullah Saleh, we invite them to be in a part of this national dialogue. And we did a great, a great national dialogue that continued for about one year. And with this national dialogue, we produce draft of constitution. This draft of constitution guaranteed most of the demands of people for democracy, for human rights, and for good governance. 
and also for women's rights, kids' rights, etc., etc. So that was the biggest victory that we did, the national dialogue and the draft of constitution. And we were just steps, steps to go to take this to the referendum and to make the election. And all these things make our neighbors ruled by other tyrannies, by monarchies, who doesn't like democracy, be really very afraid from the revolution itself, and also very afraid from, okay, Yemen is just, you know, has steps to enter to the future, to be a really democratic country, and how this very important and very big country, the rich country in the history and in resources, and to be, in addition to that, to be a Democrat, that will be something very bad to them, as they think. So Saudi and Emirates and Iran conspired against our revolution and led counter-revolution in Yemen. And also the same thing with other you know, countries in Syria, in Egypt, in Tunis and Libya, and they are the head of the counter-revolution that doesn't want people to win in their battle of democracy. As you know, there is a big difference between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There is a big difference and there is big fight between them, but they are in agreement, direct agreement or indirect agreement that our country shouldn't be democrat. So they are against our people and they waged all kind of revenge against people in Arab Spring countries, against the revolution of Arab Spring countries, and against the revolutionary people themselves. Iran supported the Houthi militia on their coup. Saudi and Emirates waged a war against Yemen. And since that, since September 2014, which is the coup of the Houthi militia coup, supported by Iran, then 2015 in March, the war of Saudi and Emirates, it's a kind of revenge against Yemeni people, against their will of democracy. And until now, we are suffering from this counter-revolution revenge, but Yemeni people are stronger than them, and they will defeat these two projects, the project of Saudi and Emirates and the project of Iran in Yemen. The same thing in Egypt, the same thing in Syria, in Tunis, in Libya, in Sudan. All the countries suffered from this counter-revolution, from the revenge of those dictators in the region uh, against the people who really want democracy and peace in their countries. Oh, and it's just absolutely... I mean, it's been years now that has led to the worst humanitarian crisis of modern times, what it's been called, what's going on in Yemen at the moment currently. And one UN estimate says that the war has left nearly 80% of the country's population in need of some form of assistance, about 21.6 million people requiring humanitarian assistance, 12.9 million of those being children, damaged food systems, local infrastructure, the economy, education. I'm wondering what you would want people outside of Yemen to know about what's currently going on inside of the country. The humanitarian crisis is a result of this ugly war, the ugly war waged by Saudi, Emirates, and Iran. And what the international community should know, what the people around the world should know, that Yemen suffer from internal incubation led by Houthi militia, backed by Iran, and from external incubation led by Saudi and Emirates. So this is very important to know what is happening in Yemen. Unfortunately, some people, they said, or some media outlets said that yeah, so Yemen is uh, suffering from war led by Saudi. And some of them, they said it's the Houthi militia and Iran there. No, we are suffering from both, from both. And both of them, they are destroying Yemen. Both of them, they are killing Yemenis. Both of them, they are the cause of the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. And both of them, doesn't want Yemen to be a democratic country. And now the worst thing is that the Saudi and Emirates, they are not just waging the war in, against Yemen. It is just, you know, missiles between them and Houthis. No, 
they are occupying the lands, the airports, the ports, and they are supporting another militias. They said that they want to help Yemenis against the Houthi militia while they are supporting another militias. That is, this militia, oh, they're just loyal to Saudi and Emirates, not to the Yemeni government or Yemeni authority. They are, Saudi and Emirates, double the legitimate authority, and they produced another council that doesn't represent, they said it is the presidency council, while this presidency council doesn't represent Yemenis, they are only represent the Saudi and Emirates interests in Yemen, their occupation of Yemen. So this is what is happening in Yemen. So anyone want to make solution, help Yemenis on their battle against the war, they have to help them to support them, to stop the hegemony and the guardianship of Saudi and Emirates. And their occupation should be stopped now. The same thing with Houthi militia, that they have to stop their coup. They have to hand over their weapons. All the militia weapons should be withdrawn. Only the Yemen country, the Yemen government, the Yemen authority should be the only body of the country that possess the weapons, not the militias. And also the economy solution, they have to help Yemen to rebuild Yemen, the reconstruction. And the same thing also, the transitional justice is very important. It's very important. The war criminals should face justice. And also we should guarantee that those crimes will not repeat again. So there is a comprehensive recipe for stopping war in Yemen. Stopping war in Yemen, it doesn't mean that stopping the missiles between Houthi and Saudis. It's bigger than that. That is just a temporary truce between Saudi and Houthis, but that doesn't mean that the war in Yemen stopped. So that's a lot of what needs to be done to just stop that war. And then on top of that, it's finishing what you started and actually carving that path to a democratic Yemen. Thank you, Anna, for saying that. Thank you so much. And this is a very important point. And we should start it again from the point that we stopped, which is the draft of the Constitution should go to the referendum and the election should be organized again. So this is a very important because there are some solutions that ignore that. So now uh, we are calling for sustainable peace and democracy in Yemen. Not a temporary truce that will maybe make another chance for another ugly war in Yemen. I am with truth, but truth that will really make the way is easy to reach to the sustainable peace and democracy. I hope you're enjoying this episode. We'll be right back after this short break to hear Tawakal talk more about what the path to a democratic Yemen looks like. So what do you think that path looks like? That's what needs to be done. But is there anything that you can say to how to get there? When I explain what is the current situation and how Yemeni people suffer, what the counter-revolution did to my country, and etc., it doesn't mean that we fail in this battle. No, it means that we still in the bottom of this battle. We didn't give up and we will not give up. And really, I am so proud of Yemeni people because Yemeni people didn't give up in front of all these projects, in front of Saudi, Emirates War, and the Houthi militia coup. And Yemeni people are there and Yemen, yes, it suffered from the humanitarian crisis, from all this war, but Yemeni people is still so strong in the field. They are also the social link between Yemeni people become stronger and stronger. And Yemeni people also lead their country from inside the country. It's amazing, amazing when you go to this country, to the cities, and you see how Yemeni people doing, you know, in their daily life without a government, without authority, under the war, under the coup, you will be so proud of this country that doesn't really destroy it from inside. 
I am so optimistic in the future. I am so optimistic even in the current because yeah, many people know now really their enemies and this is very important for anything, for any victory to know who is the one who make the obstacles want to destroy you. Why I'm saying that? Because before some people said, no, Saudi and the Emirates doesn't want you know, to destroy Yemen. They want to help the Yemenis. And some of them said before, no, Houthi doesn't want and they are against Saudi. The scene was not clear as now. So Yemeni people now really know what is happening and really know how to solve this problem. So yeah, many people now is coming together, working together again, and will produce another solution. You will be surprised by the new solution that yeah, many people are preparing now to face both outsider agenda in Yemen, Iran, which supported Saudi militia and Saudi and Emirates. So I am optimistic. So the solution is there, but we are working on it. Incredible. I heard you talk about as well how the Arab Spring comes in waves, 2011, 2019, there'll be a third, and that will just continue until there are no more dictators. And I've also heard you say this quote, which I like, which is, change toward democracy and freedom is not only possible, it is inevitable. So I'm really inspired by the hope and optimism that you hold. Thank you, Anna. And this is also something I want to also to focus on. When they decide with the counter-revolution countries, Saudi Emirates and Iran, when they decided to revenge against our people, they wanted to send a message to all Arab people in general. In 2011, we revolt against the dictators in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, and in Tunis, in just five countries. And they make revenge against us, which take many faces. They supported military coup in Egypt, for example, that produced a Sisi. They supported terrorism in Syria, in Libya, with ISIS, also with Haftar. They supported Houthi militia in Yemen and they wage war in Yemen and in Tunis. They supported the counter-revolution that produced Qais bin Said. So the counter-revolution take many, many, many faces that produced this chaos. War, people entered to the prison, thousands of people, they killed thousands, etc., etc. So when they make these brutal things against people of these countries, they wanted to send messages to their people in their countries and to other people in the countries that didn't revolt. That, look, what is the destiny of revolution? It's chaos, it's civil wars, it's military coup, it's terrorism, it's division, etc., etc. But what was the answer from the people? There was another answer in 2019, which is another revolution, the second revive of revolutions in Sudan, in Algeria. It started also in Lebanon and Iraq, but Corona came. So we changed even, you know, Bashir in Sudan. We changed Bouteflika in Algeria. And so you should expect more revolutions in the coming years. So people didn't stop their dream, also didn't become afraid from the revenge. No, they give them more belief that they are in the right side of the history. So we will not give up. Arab Spring will not finish. Yes, the counter-revolution win in this term, but it is a fake winning. It's a fake winning. People will not lose their dream, their suffer, and their struggle, and their desire and insisting to win the battle. And we know, all the people know, who read the history know, that after every great revolution, there is a counter-revolution. So this happened in all the revolutions around the world. So we are facing the same thing, but of course, we will reach to the destiny of democracy. Incredible. Incredible. So switching gears for a minute here, I want to talk about women. You have said that behind every great revolution, there are brave women. Can you tell us what did you mean by that? And what was women's role in all of this, everything that we've been talking about? The women's role in the revolution was iconic. Without the real participation of women in the Arab Spring and now in front of all the chaos that uh, waged by the counter-revolution, 
we wouldn't win that battle when we overthrow Ali Saleh in Yemen, Hosni Mubarak in, in, in Egypt, Muammar al-Qaddafi in Libya, and Bin Ali in Tunis, and as I said, al-Bashir in Sudan, and Bouteflika in Algeria, and so on. So women was really, really in the main field of revolution, <coughs> in all the details, in the political field, in the leading the streets, in the health field, and also in the transitional period, women really did most of the details. So yes, behind every great revolution, there is a brave woman. There are many brave women that lead and that also ignited, you know, that calls people for making this revolution. But the question, what is the destiny of women after winning this battle? Unfortunately, after revolutions, men came and hijacked the revolution and taking the leadership. And this is wrong. And I think we in the Arab Spring countries started to stop that. In Yemen, for example, Yemeni women, as they lead the revolution, we lead the transitional period. We lead the national dialogue. We lead the constitution. And we put in the constitution many guarantees that women will be there everywhere in every field. So I am so proud of the rule of women in all Arab countries, in all the world, especially, you know, that the world that suffer from the crisis and wars, like now in Ukraine, how women in Ukraine play a very great role on freeing their country from the occupation of Russia and from the war of Russia. So yes, uh, I'm so proud to be woman. And I am so proud to be one of those women that make changes in their countries and in the world. And nothing for me is important than leading revolutions. So this is the most dangerous and the most important war and duty for women to fulfill. Yeah, and women and the youth were yeah, very much leading the charge here on this one. So I'm wondering then, what do you hope will be most different when you look at the position of women in society today? What do you hope will be most different for Yemeni's women in 10 years' time? First, to have a country. So to have a country, it is the most important thing for women to have a state because the state now is not there. The state now is under the hands of Saudi Emirates and Iran, under the hands of the militias. So we couldn't speak about women's rights as a part. We need a state that women and men can live in it. So having a state, having a democratic state, having a unified state because the agenda of Saudi and Emirates especially they want to divide Yemen. And women in Yemen doesn't accept that and will not accept that. They want to divide Yemen. They want to destroy Yemen. So what women in Yemen want, we want to free our country. And not we want, we are working on that. We are leading that path on freeing our country from Saudi from Emirates, from this incubation, from this ugly war, and also from the militia coup. So to rebuild our Yemen, that will gather all Yemeni people from all sects. This is what we are working for. It is to rebuild Yemen, to build a new Yemen, a democratic Yemen, a unified Yemen. It's to fire all the outsiders from our country, and to put our referendum in our draft of constitution to the referendum. And because we know that the constitution that we as women wrote will give all Yemeni women their rights. All Yemeni citizens, not just Yemeni women, all Yemeni citizens their rights. Wonderful, Tawakal. Thank you so much for your time today. Happy birthday to you. And thank you for all of your incredible work. It was lovely speaking with you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anna. And I hope that uh, someday, maybe very soon, I will invite you to my house in Yemen. And you will see how Yemen is great and how we will be able to rebuild our country. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and think that we need more of women's stories in the world, be sure to share with a friend. 
and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to help us beat those pesky algorithms. Follow us on socials for more content from the episodes and a look behind the scenes. And for access to bonus content and ad-free listening, consider becoming a patron of the podcast. This is the best way to help me continue to put out more and better episodes. Or you can buy me a metaphorical coffee. All of this goes directly into production costs. And in exchange, you'll receive my eternal gratitude and a good night's sleep, knowing that you are helping to finally change the story of mankind to the story of humankind. This episode was produced and hosted by me, Anna Steckline. It was edited by Maddie Searle, with communication support by Joe Cummings. A special thanks to Amanda Brown, Kate York, and Dan Kendall for their ongoing production support and invaluable advising. Tune into the next episode of The Story of Woman, where I speak with leading activist and the founder of Girls Who Code and the Marshall Plan for Moms, Reshma Sajani. You talk to women in Ghana, you talk to women in India, you talk to women in the UK, you talk to women in the United States. And if you ask them, what is standing in the way of you in true freedom? And they'll say, childcare. They'll say paid leave. They'll say, I actually make less the minute I become a mother. And so we know that when you change these three things, you get far closer to equality. And you have examples of that in Norway, in Canada, and other countries that have been actually fixing the structure rather than trying to fix women. And so this to me is at the heart of the conversation that we need to have around gender equality right now.